first of all, it's a, it's a real honor to be invited um, to speak. I really appreciate the invitation by Dr. Noha and the rest of uh, the committee. And, and having uh, listened now to the presentations by Drs. Mustafa and Mahmoud, I understand where I fit in. This is a, a great sort of compliment because as you'll see, I'll be talking about many of the same things, but really from the consumer perspective. Um, so just as background, my, my, um, my history just very briefly is that I used to work in product development. I was trained as a mechanical engineer and I worked in product development in the, in the power tool industry and in the computer industry uh, for years and was interested in sustainability. And um, so my research, even though my teaching really focuses on innovation, my research is all about consumer psychology. And so understanding individual decision making. And so what I'm going to be sharing with you today is a presentation about um, a theory and measure of consumer wisdom. And I've got a few different uh, projects that I will share with you that are all uh, related. And some of this, I'll be taking you through some specific details just to understand a little bit about the methodology, how the theory was developed and how the measures uh, were developed. But I'll try to do that lightly, appreciating that we have a very diverse audience today and you're really most interested in sort of the big ideas and how these relate to concepts like smart cities and um, green cities and uh, GIS, uh, et cetera. So first I wanna um, try a little bit of an experiment here. Um, I'm gonna be talking a, a bunch, but I'd like to hear from you as well. I just wanna ask you a question in particular. I know that we have a lot of faculty on today, but we also have students, master's students and PhD students. And I was wondering if you could um, put in the chat what you think wisdom means. So I have a title here that I'm you know, gonna be talking about consumer wisdom. And you've heard from Dr. Mahmoud about smart cities and smart living. What do you think wisdom is? What does wisdom mean to you? And this isn't, this isn't a test. I just like to sort of hear your different perspectives. So just put that in the chat. We call this a, a waterfall. And let's see if we get some different ideas about what wisdom means. So who's gonna be the brave, brave person and go first? Good, so it comes from an accumulation of experience, ability to make the best choices, rationality, good. So let's get a few more ideas. Anything that you can add to that or expand on it? And in particular, think about how wisdom, what, what does it mean to be wise as opposed to being smart? Aha, considering the long-term impact. Okay, now we're expanding it. Efficiency, good, good. Having knowledge. So knowledge, experience, and thinking about the long term. So those are some terrific sort of um, ways of thinking about wisdom. And the reason I ask about this is that you know this is central to the work that I'm doing. And wisdom isn't something that's discussed much, it, at least in, in the United States. And I would argue that you know the world needs more wisdom right now. We do in the U.S. and, and I think internationally as well. And I'd argue that much of what we're talking about really is about wisdom, about wise cities uh, even. So thank you for that input. Um, let me just go ahead and, and share just a very brief background. So in my field, we talk a lot about sustainability and the, and the concept of sort of materialism and overconsumption. And we recognize that we can't consume at the levels that we do. And you've maybe heard the quote, that if everyone consumed like Americans, we would need five Earths worth of resources. It's just not sustainable. And that's true for much of Europe um, as well. Uh, so we need less consumption. But at the other extreme, you know, we also have problems across the world. Um, we have you know, scarcity, poverty, and great suffering that exists, people who don't have what they need. And so I would argue in how I'd like to frame this is that you know, we, we know that not having enough is not fair. We know that having too much or taking too much out of the system is not sustainable. And so the question is, what is, what is the middle ground, right? And that's one of the ways that wisdom has been approached by philosophers is sort of the theory of um, moderation. But let me, let me sort of give you some formal definitions. So, so wisdom is really the pursuit of flourishing, the pursuit of well-being and a good life. 
for yourself and for others would be one simple um, definition. And there are different definitions that we could draw from, um, you know, that go back to the, the Greeks. Um, but I'll, I'll draw your focus to the bottom quote here. This is coming um, from, from Robert Stern. And let's see if I can use, there we go, just write down here. So Robert Sternberg is a, he's a, <clears throat> a psychologist and he's a very useful sort of way to understand wisdom. And even sort of how being wise is a little bit different than being smart. So wisdom is about managing um, and balancing different tensions and trade-offs. And so when you are pursuing your own well-being, you also need to consider others' well-being. And so considering both of those in parallel is a wise and challenging thing to do. Likewise, you can pursue your own well-being or focus on the well-being of others in the short term, but sometimes we need to think about how that affects the long term. And so a simple way, an easy way to think about wisdom is that wisdom is about making as many of you said, having knowledge and experience and making the right choices in the right situation, but it's doing so considering your own needs, other people's needs, and doing that in balance in the short term and the long term. And so that's, that's um, why I'm interested in, in wisdom, which surprisingly hasn't been something that has been a focus in consumer psychology um, at all uh, until relatively recently. Good news is that wisdom has been a topic for for, for millennia, you can go back thousands of years and there's lots of great writing and thinking about um, wisdom. More recently in psychology, there's been a resurgence of interest really over the last 30 years. So in the last years, psychologists have come up with different uh, frameworks and theories of what wisdom is, as well as different measures. So you could complete a survey the same way that we complete surveys to sort of figure out what our personality is. You can complete a survey to gauge how wise you are. The challenge is that you know, wisdom in one domain saves wisdom in another domain. Being a wise parent doesn't mean necessarily that you are a wise manager. Being a wise scholar doesn't necessarily mean uh, that you are a wise uh, you know, husband or wife. So there are different domains of wisdom that may be related, um, but really do deal with different sorts of particular issues. So the first project that I'm gonna introduce was a few years was published in the Journal of Consumer Psychology in 2018. This is the research in which with the co-author David Mick, I developed the first framework, um, empirically driven framework of consumer wisdom. Wisdom, as I mentioned, has been addressed by psychologists. And so psychologists are concerned with the question of what is general wisdom? General wisdom typically is really focused on our social lives and decision-making within that context. And there are many different theories and measures. These are some of the elements that I to share. Decision-making, pro-social attitudes and behaviors. So the, the, the active presence of morality and ethical decision-making is fundamental to wisdom. That's when we did beyond simply being smart. Is being, is being wise means re reflecting your moral concerns. Reflection and self-understanding, coping with uncertainty and emotional balance. So these are things that are generally understood, at least within general wisdom theory. And then there's some other dimensions that are less common, but I think are interesting. Tolerance, openness, spirituality, and sense of humor. People have argued that these are also components of wisdom. But again, my interest as a consumer psychologist who wants to inform policymakers, but also inform marketers and the people who are designing and building. I mean, my background is in product development, and I want to inform the people who are designing our cities, who are designing our systems, who are designing these smart homes, um, so that we can design things that people want to consume and use and will use. And that's um, part of my, my intention. So what I did, I play the video here, but I'd be happy to share some of these videos with some of you if you're interested another time is I and there's a procedure for society, so you can go learn from them so there actually are protocols in psychology for doing this it takes quite a bit of time but I identified people that were described as wise within their communities they did not know that I was studying wisdom and I went and I studied them in their lives and I went and visited them all across the United States this is the the, this initial phase of research was focused on the US, but I've since tested this across, um, across other geographies. And I interviewed them to learn about how they consume. 
How do they spend their money? How does money fit into their lifestyle? And what are the choices that they make? And what informs their choices? And how do they integrate morality into their decision making and, and think about the future in balance with the present? And the people that I spoke with were varied. They ranged in age from very young up to people in their 80s and 90s. It was everything from farmers um, to uh, you know, physicians, accountants, and, uh, and teachers. So a wide uh, variety of people. And the different elements that emerged, so likewise in consumer or in, uh, in general wisdom, we have different dimensions of wisdom. These are the five facets that emerged in this initial research project. And I'll just describe these briefly. So if you were to describe a wise consumer, these are the five things that you would look for, according to the theory. One is intentionality. So the wise consumer understands what sort of a lifestyle they want to lead, and they're real about lifestyle. And they manage resources, time, and money to make that lifestyle possible. And one of the things that jumped out from the interviews that I conducted is that this is about time that is money. I think those uh, trying to take as much money as possible so that they can buy more things with the false hope somehow that's going to make them happier. They understand that there are trade-offs there that need to be made. Second is um, somebody said rationality. Well, I'll expand on this. Wisdom is about more than rationality. So, you know, in their self-interest, we're going to benefit them. But they're also very good at imagining future scenarios and whether or not, you know, buying, we'll buy in that new vehicle that you really think you want because you've been watching the commercial and you have that money. These people, people are able to think ahead and imagine, how will my life be different? And is that trade-off worth it, given the other priorities in my life? So they're very active and sort of what I refer to as prospection. Next is emotional mastery. These people are very good at avoiding decisions and situations um, that will lead to things like you know, guilt and regret. And they're very good at promoting um, positive emotions. So this isn't about avoiding all consumption, but it's focusing on consumption that really promotes your well-being. So consumption that, that brings you joy, that um, helps you develop relationships with others, right? So cultural activities, spending money on food, uh, travel post-COVID. <laughs> these are all things that can promote um, well-being. And these people certainly weren't just trying to save money. They were trying to save money so they could spend more on the things that really mattered to them. Then openness. These people are characteristically very open um, they wanted to grow as people, but they were also very open and curious about different ways of consuming. They were more likely to be open to the idea of purchasing used goods or repairing goods, even if they had the resources to buy new goods instead. These are all things related to personal well-being. And the other dimension really sort of brings us together is what at the time I referred to as transcendence. But think of this as sustainability. And you'll see from my more recent project, it is now actually called sustainability. But this is all about decision-making that is influenced by our concern for the environment, for social causes, and for people whose lives we affect even though we don't directly inter interact with them. So um, at a high level, consumer wisdom is, as I mentioned before, it's concern of yourself and collective well-being. And these were the five dimensions that based on a wide ranging set of interviews, we uncovered. So um, that was the first step. Now, the second step was to validate this empirically, because this was a grounded theory project, meaning that we were interviewing people and basically synthesizing those ideas from all those people we interviewed. But now it's time to actually create a survey. So survey questions that anyone could respond to, and then collecting data from thousands of people, nationally representative samples internationally. And this is a project um, that is not yet published in JCP, but was formally accepted two weeks ago. So this will be in the Journal of Consumer Psychology in the coming months. So um, I'm not gonna take you through all the studies in detail, but I do wanna highlight some of the studies. The first one was basically developing all of the survey questions and um, identifying which of the questions were the best. And I won't go through all the different statistical techniques, but what we found along the way was that Statistically, anyway, even though we created these boundaries around five 
dimensions, there really ended up being six. And we relabeled re some of these to reflect them a bit more. Um, but the content is exactly the same as what I described to you, but the boundaries are a little bit different. And I'll, I'll elaborate on that in a second. But what was interesting statistically is that there is a higher, and I'll get into just a little bit of statistical theory. There is what referred to as a higher order construct of consumer wisdom. There is such a thing as consumer wisdom, but there also are these discrete individual dimensions. And that's interesting, and I'll get to this later, because what it means is that you know, as you're reading through this, you may recognize that you are maybe stronger in some of these than others. And so this theory allows that some people may be more advanced in some of these dimensions um, than other dimensions. And that has, that has some relevance that I'll, I'll allude to later. This is a, a mapping of the current framework. The final framework and the current scale has six dimensions. Um, and that's just, I, I wanted to just share this because the naming is a little bit different, but now again, based on, on much more um, data. And I'd be happy to share this with, with um, Dr. Noha afterwards, if, if, you know, if you'd like to share this, particularly with some of the students, but this is the scale. And so I invite you another time to you know, consider completing the scale and seeing where you are especially strong. Um, uh, you know, and that's an interesting exercise, but there are 24 questions, four questions for each of these. And the six dimensions are responsibility, purpose, flexibility, perspective, reasoning, and sustainability. So this is my definition of what, what wisdom is, at least in the context of our material lives. We understand wisdom, I think, more in the context of our social lives, but when it comes to money in the world of things, um, you know, this is, this is our intention as a co-author team was to provide that sort of a framework. Now, some of these other studies I will go through through much faster, so I apologize if, if you're gonna miss some of the details, but I just wanna give you a sense of it. One of the things you need to do when you develop a scale is you need to show how that scale relates to other measures, other constructs that are in the literature. And we have lots of different measures in consumer psychology that measure things that we think might be good, right? That, that maybe are related to smart or wise consumption. So people having self-control, people having a growth mindset, people being green or socially responsible. So one of the things you need to do when you develop a new scale is show that your scale is related in expected ways to existing scales, but that it is not the same. Um, and at the same time, you want, want to show that it's inversely related to other things. So this shows, for example, if you just look in the upper, upper right here, this shows that consumer wisdom is inversely related to materialism, which you would expect but it's not just the mirror image. It's not just the absence of materialism. There's much more, uh, there's much more to it. So this is simply showing that there's an, what we refer to as a nomological network, that consumer wisdom relates in expected ways to existing, existing constructs. But what's interesting from my perspective is that we have lots of different measures in my field, but they measure very narrow slices of people's behavior and thinking. And with consumer wisdom, what we're trying to do is provide a much more holistic single measure so that you can understand people. I mean, people are much more complex. You can understand them in a multidimensional way uh, rather than using lots and lots of different scales um, just to use uh, the one. So we had another study that shows that these measures are stable over time, and I won't go through the details on that. But if we, if we give people the scale today, if I gave you the scale today, I could very easily predict or strongly predict how you would answer the same scale questions in, in eight weeks. So it tends to be in the short term a relatively stable um, measure. Now, one of the key things you need to do with the scale is show that it matters, right? And, and if we're arguing that consumer wisdom predicts well being, well, we need to show that it does that, but we need to show that it offers incremental predictive validity. And so, in other words, if you look at different measures of well being, and um, you know, there are a variety of them, but there, there are few on, on the right side here. So inventory of thriving, meaning in life, satisfaction with life, your perceived financial well-being. These are various measures of well-being that relate to sort of cognitive aspects of people's experience, relates to affective or sort of their subjective experience. Now, the things that we know predict people's well-being are things like relationship support, 
relationships have profound impact. It's one of the reasons that COVID has been so hard on so many people is that absent these close relationships and human contact, we really struggle. So we know that personal relationships are important. We know that having a meaningful job is important to your well-being. And we know that being physically healthy is important to well-being. So the question is, does consumer wisdom offer incremental? Is it, is it going to predict well-being even with all these other predictors included in a model? And the answer, of course, I wouldn't be presenting the results if the answer were not yes. So the answer is that, that yes, it does. And I'll just walk you very briefly through the statistics. Very, very briefly, because this is going to be a busy slide here. So essentially three models. In the first model, we don't include any of the predictors. We just include um, the demographic variables. And so we see, for example, these are, are, are different measures of, um, of, of uh, well-being. So thriving, meaning in life, subjective well-being, and, and perceived financial well-being. And not surprisingly, um, your well-being is predicted by education and your income. What's interesting is when you then add in other things, such as, for example, personal relationship support, um, job satisfaction, and your health, what we see is that there's much less of an effect, in fact, no effect of education. It's not that education or money matter on their own, but they tend to be correlated to whether or not you have a meaningful job and whether you are healthy and whether you have healthy relationships. So all those things end up being highly predictive. And so the fundamental final question is, does, uh, does consumer wisdom offer additional incremental power? And it does. These are coefficient um, coefficients that basically these are all significant. And you can see that these are about the same size as these other measures. What this says in short is that your ability to make wise decisions about saving and spending money has as much impact on your subjective well-being and even on your, your BMI, on your level of uh, your risk of obesity. It predicts that as well, I show in another study. So that's as important as relationship support, job satisfaction, and health. Yet it's something that we don't really think about um, uh, or measure today. So the final, the final um, uh, bit of information I wanted to share here, and then I'll quickly touch on some other studies, is we wanna show that uh, consumer wisdom is predictive of behaviors that we think matter. And so for example, um, what we did was compare measure, this is the best measure today of general wisdom. And this is our measure of consumer wisdom. And we did a study to basically um, gauge um, how related these are to different good behaviors. So what we found is that consumer wisdom is um, highly related to whether or not people exercise, eating vegetables, controlling the amount that they eat and eating healthy foods, having a plant-based diet, avoiding meat consumption, which is relevant for sustainability, um, purchasing in environmentally responsible ways, saving money, um, all sorts of different things that are related to well-being. And what you see here is that general wisdom does not predict many or most of these. And so consumer wisdom is a, is a unique measure in this unique domain. Interestingly, and as expected, general wisdom does predict friendship intensity, whereas consumer wisdom does not. But consumer wisdom is not intended to be really a measure of sort of your relationships. It's really a measure of your relationship with money and spending and the material world. So enough about that. I wanna to touch briefly on two other projects that are currently underway. And then I, I, I would welcome any questions that you have at that point. One study um, in, in this, uh, I apologize, the slides, I need to update these because they use some of the older terms. But the question is, if you have six dimensions of consumer wisdom, you know, are we all necessarily gonna be high or low? And the answer is no, we're gonna vary. You know, one person with a measure of 100 in the consumer wisdom scale may be very different as a consumer than another person with a score of 100. And so if you look at a distribution of scores and just by luck, the, um, the average score for wisdom across the scale in the US is 100, just a fortunate number and the standard deviation is about 25 points. But you can do analysis and find that there are actually some very different types of people here, and this is preliminary data. These are the wise consumers. These are the wise consumers on the left. Score higher demand. 
have, and I probably need a more kind way to describe these people, but then I have what I tentatively re referred to as the foolish consumers. They score low on all of these dimensions. What's more interesting are people in the middle. The pe people who, for example, very um, uh, poor at managing their own life, at managing things that really promote their own well being, but they care tremendously about about the environment and social causes. And then you have other people who I would refer to as smart, who are very good at promoting their own well-being, but may, maybe not nearly as focused in promoting the well-being of others. So the point is we can't think of consumer wisdom, even though I have a single measure here, as unidimensional. There really are different dimensions that are related but may move differently. And this is important from a policy perspective because if we can identify different populations that you know, can be educated along different dimensions, then we can influence um, their behavior. So, um, and then I also show that you know, these different clusters have different levels of, of, of well-being. The final study, which I wanted to spend just a few minutes on because I think it's particularly relevant for this audience, um, in a way, this final study, which is a work in process uh, with a couple of co-authors uh, from uh, the TU Delft in the Netherlands. And this has been on hold for a little bit of time while I've been completing the scale work and also because of COVID. But instead, to me, this is a study, which is um, a study that is intended to then use this framework, and this understanding of consumer wisdom to help guide designers. Because consumer, we can, we can hold consumers responsible for the choices they make today in the amount of consumption, but the problem is they have a limited universe of options. When it comes to housing, it was fascinating to me to listen and hear about smart buildings. And it made me w wish that in the United States, we had more options when it came to smart houses. We have lots of dumb houses that are bigger than we need, that waste lots of energy, that require more furniture. They're very wasteful, but we just don't have very good options. And I think that there's a great opportunity for designers to create better options, not just for consumer products, electronics and other products, right? We could create more circular products like modular phones that can be repaired, et cetera, but also better choices for homes and vehicles. And in vehicles, that's happening very quickly. So the research approach here is basically to use the consumer wisdom framework and to think about consumption very broadly and to try to find all of the different theories and practices of design. There are many different sort of frameworks for design that exist today. And so what we're trying to do is essentially map on the consumer wisdom framework to all these um, uh, different design theories and frameworks that are kind of out there but haven't been related in a cohesive way. So we're trying to come up with a more holistic way for designers to think about these issues. So by using keywords and searching through all of the different you know, um, key literature uh, uh, you know, sources, the journals for, for design, um, it, it, we've come up with you know, a preliminary set of theories and frameworks that we can then map back onto consumer wisdom. And without getting into a lot of the, the details here, the idea then is that designers can take a given design, you know, and it could be something as simple as a coffee maker or something bigger like a house, and then they can analyze different design options as you're thinking about different scenarios and to do this through the different lenses of the wise consumer and wise consumption. So you can rate that design along the six dimensions. Is it consistent with each of those dimensions and to what degree? So that you could, for example, take two different alternative designs and we can analyze those in different ways in terms of their cost, manufacturability. But if we can also rate them in terms of how wise they would be from a consumer perspective, um, then that might help guide designers. And that's, that's sort of the, the vision um, for that. So I, I appreciate that's a lot of information to share at once. And I, I've been doing a lot of um, talking <laughs> and I appreciate your attention through this, but probably wise for me at this point to stop and, and invite any questions you have about consumer wisdom, or I welcome, of course, thinking about the intersection I work in and the work by um, doctors uh, Mahmoud and, and Mustafa because we're talking about the same thing just from different different lenses and, and perspectives. 
Thank you so much, Michael. This was uh, uh, very interesting. Uh, I mean, I, I have so many questions myself, but it's not wise to start <laughs> start with my questions. Uh, so I'm going to open uh, the floor for the audience. Uh, please uh, raise your hand if you raise a hand on the Zoom if you would like to ask um, a question. And I warn you, if you don't have questions for me, I do have another quiz question for you. So there, we'll see. There is a hand up, um, Mr. Ahmad Huidi. Uh, can you unmute yourself and uh, go ahead and uh, ask the, your question? Hello and uh, good afternoon. Um, I'm Ahmad Huidi. I'm from the Civil Engineering Department. Um, it was Hello. a. I'm sorry, you're muted. You're muted. Okay. Can you hear me right now? Yes, yeah. thank you. Hello? Yeah. Uh, it was a really insightful presentation. Maybe looking from a consumer perspective, it gives you a different view of um, what you should implement. Uh, my question is a bit broad, but you've been talking a lot about wisdom and how we should target our designs and our work toward the, the wise consumer. So um, it's not always the case. So you're not always, uh, you, whether for example, I have a client, whether I have um, a product that I'm designing, I'm not usually, I'm not always, um, target, I don't, my consumer or my client isn't usually the wise one. So um, is it really the best, is it really the best way? I mean, from a, a logical perspective, I would like to, um, educate uh, this person and have them get, become more wise, but I don't think this is always feasible. Sometimes you are um, con uh, um, constrained to you doing dumb decisions just because this is what's required or what, this is what's needed by um, what, whether it's upper management or whether it's the owner itself. So what's your um, perspective about dealing with this? That's an excellent, excellent question. Um, so and just to quantify what you're saying, you're asking a good question. Why develop products for these wise consumers if they are not the norm? And in fact, my data suggests that in the United States, you could, you could maybe identify about 15% of the population as wise. So here's how I would think about it. Um, this is, you know, it's a bit of the chicken, the egg problem, but this is the key opportunity in business. So from a business perspective, we live in a hyper-competitive world with lots of different products and services made by lots of different people. And companies are constantly looking for ways to innovate. And I, would, I, would, I know the dynamics are different in a civil engineering context, but I teach in a business school, so I'll just sort of answer it from that perspective. I, you know, from a business perspective, this is one of the key ways to be different, to innovate. And if you can actually create a product that is better for the individual, not just in the short term, but in the long term, you're gonna get better brand loyalty, you're gonna command better premiums, you're gonna have more word of mouth, you're gonna have a competitive differentiator. So that's how, the, that's how this works in sort of the business world, I would argue, is that in a very competitive environment, companies are looking um, for ways to differentiate. And I would argue that we are becoming wiser. You know, I can't speak for, for, for everyone everywhere, but I would argue that we are becoming wiser. I think, and I love Dr. Noha's very optimistic and positive view to start off our conference because I am very, very optimistic. And I think that there's a lot of wisdom that's gonna come out of the horrible experience over the last year and people recognizing sort of, you know, the benefit of, of a different approach and appreciating maybe how good we had it and things that we need to do moving forward. What's interesting to me, especially about your question though, is that you know, how do we make wise decisions from a government perspective? And that's, you know, I'm not an expert um, there. I, I think though that having at least a perspective to understand how sort of emerging consumers might be thinking about this is a benefit, at least in making tiebreakers if you're choosing between different sort of design options. But that was, that was a very good question. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you, Dr. Michael. I think uh, we have uh, Shuruk and then Dr. Mahmoud. 
so Shuru, would you unmute yourself and uh, ask your question, please? Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Michael, for this nice lecture. And um, my question is basically about uh, transformative service research. I have been interested in this area previously. And um, so that others as well know what transformative service research is, it's basically uh, recommending that organizations shall consider the well being of themselves as well as customers on uh, the long term in, in, in the way they provide their services. So I just had a thought that during your uh, presentation that if consumers now become um, wise and wisdom is actually the opposite to uh, materialism, don't you think that um, this is actually a threat to companies? Companies do not want wise consumers because wise consumers will then uh, stop being uh, materialistic and this actually can hurt the well-being of the organization and improve the well-being of the customer. So I just wanted to know your op opinion about this uh, perspective. So it, it's, a, it's, again, a very insightful question. But um, again, I'll approach this from a business perspective. Every company, th there's a reason why the biggest innovators tend not to be the biggest companies. Biggest companies you know, have a bias and perspective and an interest in maintaining the status quo. But smaller companies and startups have an incentive to do things differently. Um, and so I would argue, let's just use an example. Um, you know, cell phones, we all use cell phones. Um, they're, you know, important part of our lives now, um, but they are one of the most unsustainable products we have. There are lots of sort of, you know, um, important and toxic uh, materials inside of them, especially in the batteries. And with Apple products, for example, you can't even replace the battery. Um, there have been some initial experiments with modular phones um, that, that are successful to some degree in, uh, in Europe. Um, but, you know, the company that figures out how to come up with a, uh, a smartphone that has interchangeable parts, where instead of just getting a consumer for two years, you get them to buy into your system for life, is going to dominate the market. And you can go through the history of, you know, innovation and versus, you know, virtually any category, and you can see these huge shifts in terms of who was leading uh, that industry just based on on change. So I guess the way I'd frame it is that, you know, yes, if you are Apple, you don't have an incentive right now to really innovate for the wise consumer, but if you are, you know, a, a smaller company that wants to leapfrog Apple in terms of their, their market dominance, you have tremendous incentive. And if you can create value, real value for people, they will follow and spend their money on you. And that's how business works. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Mahmoud, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Yeah, thank you very much for the interesting insight and um, it gives a different kind of light on what I was talking about before. As engineers, we are mainly dealing with, with hard things. But I see the, the other side as important because we are building for people. And the people have to be able to use what we are doing and, and take the, the most benefit out of what they have been paying for, actually. Um, I think we have no other chance <laughs> in being optimistic. So. <laughs> If someone is not optimistic, then yeah, okay. Um, that brings me to the to the to the point um, when we talk about anything, anything we are we are we are doing from the engineering part, from the technology part, we have to make account for the people. And that it goes then into the area of education, um, convincing, informing, um, creating minds of a higher consciousness. I would say in a little bit philosophical way. Um, a lot, for example, in the consumption of, of buildings, let's, let's go for the building systems, lays in the behavior part. You can brush your teeth with a glass full of water or you can have the, the, the tap running and consuming five liters of water. Um, I can close the, the light when I leave the room or go out for a walk or, can, or I can, can leave, it, leave it on. So we have a large part of resource consumption in a not smart way, in a non-smart way, 
and due to behavior issues. And we have a large potential of, of getting better into less consumption with more effect. We are not, we are not losing, losing out by consuming less in certain areas. So this is not um, um, infringing into, into our comfort or in, in, into our feeling even of the luxury. Um, so we have a large potential of, of doing, of going into the right direction by educating and convincing people. That is the, it's, it's the one side. On the other side, I think, um, I'm not a regulator, but um, if you have, for example, um, high energy cost. I remember when I was a kid uh, in the late 70s, oil crisis. Suddenly the, the fuel price in Germany jumped up by, by factor of three. So this is the basis, or this was the basis for the industries to create um, less consuming engines. If we have now here in Egypt also, I mean, the subsidies have been, have been erased more, more or less, and I'm quite happy about it. I'm quite happy that the, that the, the, the gasoline cost us here eight pounds or eight and a half pounds, uh, the, the 95 rather than one pound uh, 10 years ago. Uh, this creates hopefully a, a more responsible way of, of dealing with the resource. And the same comes for water, which is still too cheap. Uh, natural gas is far too far too cheap in my opinion and electricity is still too cheap so this is the the other side so a little bit of push into the right direction by wise politicians by wise government um, will lead to supporting the wisdom part um, um, within the units so that was just um, a core comment but I, i'm very uh, thankful and it's interesting to 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 see the the, the matching areas of, of engineering technology and, and also um, the more human related aspects and psychology in the end also. So thank you very much. Thank you. And I absolutely agree with the idea of wiser government. And it's one of the reasons in the United States, I'm, I'm so happy that it's 2021. <laughs> okay, uh, we have uh, Dr. Hagar and then Miral. Uh, thank you so much for your presentation. Uh, it was really, really amazing. Um, I'm very interested in consumer psychology and uh, uh, consumer well, well be, well being in specific and the role of materialism and all of this. And I have a very um, simple question. Uh, I want to know your opinion about the role of consumer wisdom in dealing with uncertainty during uh, COVID-19, how do you see it? Uh, what is maybe the interplay between consumer wisdom and maybe retail therapy and how consumer can use it as a coping uh, mechanism? How do you believe, is it effective? Uh, is it more of a, a maladaptive uh, strategy that is not very effective? In, uh, how do you see it? How, I want to know your opinion so, and how do you see it? I, I like the question and part of the reason I like it is I actually have data so I can answer it. Okay. <laughs> So, so in the recent Journal of Consumer Psychology paper, that was actually one of the things that the reviewers asked us for. The timing of, of our data was that we had a collected data pre-COVID and they thought it would be interesting if we collected additional data um, during COVID and then you know, uh, later as COVID had sort of settled in. And so what we did was we collected data from about uh, almost a full year ago and it was the, really the height of the pandemic in the United States and the beginning of the shutdown. And, and I'm doing this from the top of my head, I don't have my paper in front of me, but the things that we saw people do in the early stages of COVID, um, they ate more sweets, um, they ate more junk food in general, they exercised less, they consumed more digital media. Um, and, uh, but their impulse purchases were not higher. Um, they were actually flat or lower because they weren't going out to stores as much, even though people were buying things online. But in general, we didn't respond in a very healthy way. So the wise consumers um, compared to the average consumer also were subject to the shock of COVID. So even wise consumers also did succumb to more digital media their diet suffered and exercise as well, but less so than um, of exercise, of um, you know, sort of limiting their purchases to things that really 
this can initial stages of COVID as well as three months ago. So the data show that you know, even wise people suffered through the beginning stages of COVID, even wise people, you know, their behavior will change from a period of shock, um, but they, are, they, they still had much healthier behaviors than the average person. So very astute question, thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Okay, uh, Miral, uh, Miral, would you unmute yourself and ask your question, please? Yes, sure. Hi, I'm Yorola, teaching assistant in the economics department. And I have like two questions that are so, uh, somehow connected to each other. Um, well, people usually criticize, for example, the term uh, ethics that what is defined as ethical might not be viewed as ethical for another person. Do you think the term consumer or wise consumer should, could be as well criticized, given that people might say that what is wise from, for someone might not be viewed as wise for another person. And so how will people design for wise people or wise consumers if they're not uh, all identical? Great question, great question. Um, because the reality is you cannot say that um, definitively a given product or service is a wise uh, decision for everyone. So wisdom is context dependent. It depends on your situation in life. It depends on your values. Um, it depends on your alternatives. And so it is very situation um, specific. But I would argue that when you're developing products, you tend to have certain segments of users in mind. And so this would be, so for anyone, and I know there's some people in the, in the conference who have experience with branding and consumer um, uh, marketing, we, we segment consumers and we look at sort of different profiles and types and so I'd suggest that, you know, consumer wisdom is just another, another way of sort of profiling different people. Now, on the one hand, I would agree with your point that it is subjective and therefore it's not definitive. But I, but I would argue also at the other extreme, there probably are certain products and there's certain features of products that we could say in general are wiser or more foolish. So, for example, and I'm, I'm thinking in, you know, in the U.S. and Europe, you know, a, uh, owning a bicycle is a very, I would argue, wise thing. It is cost-effective, it's good for your health, it's good for society, it promotes uh, you know, fun, et cetera, assuming you have a safe place to ride a bike. So I, I would argue there are some categories that are more aligned with wisdom and different features that are more aligned with wisdom. And conversely, there are probably you know, some foods and some types of products that we could say generally are less wise or maybe even foolish. But your point is a good one, which is that um, the details matter, and that's why you need to look at it by, by product and look at your customer segments that you're targeting. Thank you very much, uh, Michael. I, I, I want to um, close the session with, with a, a kind of a technical question, a um, very quick one, uh, because I want to uh, give the audience uh, a break for like 10 minutes and then we come back. Um, uh, basically, my question is, uh, I saw that there are six dimensions to the uh, consumer wisdom scale, okay? So do you think that there are, uh, that we can assign either a sequence to these dimensions, that as in some of them come before others, uh, or weights, as in some of them are based on the data more, more sig significant or more important than others or precede others? Did you find this kind of overlap uh, in, based on the data? It, it's a great question. And my hope is that someone, maybe it's something I will explore next or maybe somebody else will research it. My, my initial focus, it, it is, um, there's so many different statistical tests and so much different data um, that you need to collect to get a scale developed. You're asking a very important nuanced question, which would require really longitudinal studies. Uh, so for example, you know, does wisdom um, naturally evolve in stages where some of these dimensions you would develop before others. It's possible, but that's, that's an empirical question um, that we just, we haven't addressed yet. But I think is a, very, is a very interesting one. In terms of the weights, the scale that we have is equally weighted. Um, but again, presumably it's possible that you could, you could um, do research. In fact, I, I may even have the data for this where you look at different weighting schemes and how that relates to well-being and different forms of well-being. 
So for example, sustainability is one of the six dimensions and is a really critical component. But you know, would a better measure maybe weight sustainability, you know, double some of the others? It's an empirical question, a very, a very insightful question, but I don't have data on that. So for now, it's an equally balanced, equally weighted scale. I think it's a, it's a, it's a major step. Uh, I think it's a, it's a very important study. It's a, a needed study. And I think that it will develop further uh, with time as you know, people cite it and work with the scale and you know, conduct for further research. I personally look forward to uh, you know, having an empirical study of, <laughs> with your scale. You know? Thank you. No, I, I appreciate that. And I'd be happy, anyone who contacts me, I, I will share my most recent manuscript um, it is now available on the JCP website. I'll share the link with Dr. Noha, but anybody who emails me, I will um, tell you what, I, I, I will uh, shamelessly put my email address in here. And that way, anyone who's interested um, can email me and I can send that link to you if you're interested. I would welcome use of the scale, of course. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Dr. Mahmoud, do you wanna have a final comment? Uh... Yeah, if you allow me to. Um, I would like to, 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 to build another bridge to what I said before and sustainability, smart cities, etc. This needs fairly strong decisions on the political side, on the investment side, on, on private properties or private facilities, but mainly on the governmental side and on the regulatory side. So um, we, we have to make these decisions where to put our, our resources. Do I go or continue the conventional way? It's easier, comfortable, less, less risky probably. Or do I have the courage to go a new way, which um, might distract certain conventional industries, definitely, and certain interest groups, but in the end will benefit everyone. So, um, and that of course requires a wise approach. So wisdom, I think, uh, goes very, very, very strongly into this uh, directly materialistic uh, approach as well. And I think there's no, no way doing, based on wisdom, the right decisions with the, with the right courage and, and getting them, them really done. I think time is, time is running short. I mean, I'm optimistic, yes, but I'm also realistic in, in, in seeing certain developments around us. There's not much time to leave, um, or not much time left or, or to, be, to, be, to be lost. And this, this needs a very, very a strong and very early approach. Thank you. Thank you so Agreed. much. I couldn't agree more. Michael, you want to comment on this? Um, final comment? No, I absolutely agree. I, I, I think it, wise leadership is essential and, and critical for many of the things that need to happen in the near term. Absolutely. Uh, I think I like very much uh, the um, complementarity that we saw today. Um, this far, we still have uh, the session from Professor uh, Holger Schmidt. Um, and uh, I think uh, that, that uh, I hope that uh, students can be able to see uh, the different perspectives related to sustainability uh, and that uh, one perspective alone uh, won't advance the sustainability agenda. Uh, you need also, um, you need engineering, design, you need uh, management, uh, you need, uh, consumer research, uh, psychology research, and all of these issues to be able to have an integrated view about, uh, about sustainability. 